Okay, I guess we can start. So first of all, let me um, add a couple of things to the lecture of yesterday. So one first thing that I forgot to introduce are zero-dimensional currents. Okay, so in the case of zero dimension, actually, and this is going to be important, although, so it's way much easier than, than k, dimension, k dimensional currents for k bigger or equal than one, because essentially we, everyone saw them uh, uh, at least once. Uh, on the other hand, they are going to play a very important role later, later on. Okay, so of course I have to define you in some sense what are zero forms. So d zero of E is just going to be the space of F from your metric space into R, which are Lipschitz and bounded. Okay, then a zero dimensional <coughs> metric functional um, is a linear map from D0E into R. And of course, it has finite mass. If there exists a constant C, such that any time you evaluate T of F on, on, on a function, you get actually the inequality that this is less or equal than a constant times the supremum of modulus of F over T. Right? And of course now from this definition you just recognize that you're looking at just the dual of, of continuous functions. So there's uh, uh, a well-known theorem by Reitz that this is actually given by uh, uh, Radon measures huh? under suitable assumptions on the metric space E, which of course we were making even yesterday somehow. Suitable assumptions, this just means T is, I mean, has finite mass if and only if. T is a Radon measure. And of course you will also recognize and then our definition of um, the mass of T is then just the total variation measure of T. And the action on a function f can actually be given by the integral. So here you will have the total variation measure. Then you have f. And then let us put here uh, 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 some, OK, maybe something like nu, where nu is a Borel measurable function, which is taking which takes values plus and minus one. Okay, so and of course you can just think that this is altogether just a sign measure, which we might denote by T in this case. Okay, so that's going to play actually a, a very important role later when we will study general currents by uh, uh, the procedure which is called slicing, which is essentially trying to make uh, induction arguments on the dimension of the currents when you're actually trying to prove something. Okay, so that was one thing. And the other thing is that I actually, the, the, the remark that I gave you at the very end about currents with finite mass and the equivalence with the Federer and Fleming theory so let me actually 
just be more precise about that. So I made a mistake yesterday because I forgot an hypothesis. So the conjecture of Ambrosio and Kirchheim is that their currents of finite mass are equivalent to the currents of finite, of finite mass which are flat in the Federer-Fleming theory. So I forgot to say this word over here, which maybe for some of you does not make that much sense, but at least I want to state it correctly. Okay, and uh, 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 one direction is actually quite clear, and it's in fact this direction. So this one is simple. And that one was what we were talking about yesterday. So this is known in some dimensional case thanks to the work of Price, essentially. But more in general is still open, maybe solved by some recent results by Sjornier and Jones. So maybe soon solved. OK, so very good. Now, let me start the lecture today by giving you now some examples of currents, right? So let us, back, let us go back to the zero dimensional case. Is, sorry, to, to, the, to, the, to the Euclidean space. So let us now assume that E is equal to Rn. Okay, so we just observed zero dimensional currents of finite mass are equal to measures, to Radon measures. So that's an easy remark. remark. M plus one dimensional currents are necessarily equal to zero. So I mean, it, they, they, are, they are the empty, uh, I mean, if you want, they are the empty set, or the linear functional identically equal to zero actually does make, I think, for our definition, an M plus one dimensional current. Uh, and the reason for this is because you remember they are alternating. So it's just a simple exercise on the fact that there is no alternating n plus 1 linear form on Rn. Okay? So the next thing which might be interesting to understand is what would you expect from n-dimensional currents? Okay, so you remember that we have this um, uh, uh, chain rule property that we proved, I mean, that we didn't prove actually yesterday, but we stated. So if you remember the chain rule property, that kind of suggests you one way of constructing n-dimensional currents. So the chain rule told us if I am trying to compute T of F d psi 1 of pi wedge, wedge d psi n of pi, I actually get T of F times the determinant of graph psi composed pi d pi. And this is true for uh, 
T and dimensional current, and psi, a map which goes from Rn into Rn, right? So now if you are in the Euclidean space, right, you actually notice therefore that you can reduce everything to compute something like T of F d psi 1 of x wedge wedge d psi n of x, where now I just take, I just denote by x the identity matrix. This is actually going to be just t of f determinant of red psi dx1 wedge wedge dxn. Okay? On the other hand, now, if you actually fix Somehow, if you fix this, right, and you look at the map which is going, which is giving from G, gives you T of G dx1 wedge, wedge dxn. So if you sort of keep this part of the form constant and you actually only vary this part of the form, then you realize that your definition of currents of finite mass is giving you a linear functional on the space of functions. And you just realize that for the linear function on the space of functions that you're looking at, right, you actually have exactly the assumption of the radon Nikodim, I mean, of, 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 of the Ritz representation theorem. Hmm? So you remember then you would have for the definition of current of finite mass, right? So T, uh, uh, I mean, let's say T of G dx1 wedge, wedge dxn this thing over here is less or equal than a constant, then you would have the Lipschitz constants of x1 times xn. And these are all equal to 1. And then you would have the supremum of modulus of g over e. Right? So if you just forget about the dependence on these guys, you just see that you have the usual uh, thing which allow you to uh, apply the Ritz representation theorem. So you immediately actually conclude that t of g dx1 wedge wedge dxn must be something like the integral, right, of um, g d mu for some measure mu. And then you might try to apply the chain rule that you have over here, right? And therefore, this simply suggests that when you evaluate it, t of g d psi 1 wedge wedge d psi n. Actually, you would like to represent this guy as the integral of g determinant of red psi d mu. OK, so this is what you would like to write. But now you run somewhat into troubles because the determinant of the gradient of psi is not uh, 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 everywhere defined. So this wouldn't make actually up to a proof that your current has to be represented by this thing, because you know that psi is just a Lipschitz map, so it's differentiable almost everywhere. So if this measure were anyway a Lebesgue, uh, I mean, it's something times the Lebesgue measure, so if this measure were absolutely continuous, then this would make sense and would be defined almost everywhere. OK? So now you also see what, what, what is the connection maybe for the few people among you that know this uh, work of, um, of Price and Saunier and Jones. So one of the questions which are around are the questions for, I mean, is, is the following question. For which measure mu can I define sort of this object in such a way that it has nice properties? And the conjecture is that the only measure for which it makes sense to define this integral is the Lebesgue measure. Okay? And this is what it has been proved by Price, say, in some situation. It's in the, in the two-dimensional situation. In one dimension, it's easy. In, in two dimensions, it's fairly difficult. It has been proved by Price. And that is what needs to be generalized to uh, 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 go back to this uh, conjecture of Ambrosio and Kirchhein. Okay, so we are not going to bother about whether this fact is true or not. We just take it somehow as an inspiration to define now an n-dimensional current in the following way. We, 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 we just say if you give me a function g which is in L1 over n I define the current G in the following way. So I have to define the action of G 
on something like f d pi 1 wedge wedge d pi n when all of these are Lipschitz functions and this is by definition going to be the integral of g times the determinant of d pi times f in the Lebesgue measure. Okay, so that's one definition. And now you might maybe wonder what happens if I actually ask that, uh, that the current is normal. So when is G a normal current, what goes wrong when we use an arbitrary for our measure? Sorry? What goes wrong when we use, instead of the back measure, an arbitrary for our measure? You don't know how to define this, how to define this, ah, okay. right? I mean, this is defined point-wise almost everywhere. Okay. Of course, I mean, okay, so for instance, Say, let us make, let us make, for instance, this um, the following thing. Okay, so you, you could say the following. So, one one way around this maybe, you regularize your function f, right? You get it c1, and then you define this linear functional for an arbitrary Borel measure. Okay, mm -hmm. then of course you would like to pass to to pass into the limit in the approximation. Mm -hmm. Is this thing well defined? For instance, if this thing is converging to something, it gives you a well defined linear functional. So the kind of question that you then would like to answer is when I define this kind of functional with an arbitrary Borel measure on, on, on the space of C1 functions, when can I extend it to uh, Lipschitz functions in such a way that I get something continuous, okay? And this actually is what Price proved in two dimension. This has a continuous extension if you want to Lipschitz maps if and only if uh, uh, the, 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 um, the measure is absolutely continuous, okay? okay. okay. Oh, remember, we had to satisfy, I mean, remember, out of our definitions, we had to satisfy some continuity hypothesis. Huh? So, uh, uh, of course, you might wonder why, for instance, if I define my current in this way, why, when I have a sequence of Lipschitz maps which is converging to pi, I can actually prove that this thing behaves in a continuous way. Okay, so that is actually a nice problem. It has to do with what is called weak continuity of determinants. Hmm? So the weak continuity of determinants in the space of Lipschitz maps, which by the way is W1 infinity, actually implies that this G over here satisfies the continuity property of the theorem rest yesterday. Okay, so now we, you can actually ask when is G a normal current? And well, let us just, uh, um, so let us just imagine how you want to compute a normal current. So remember what is the boundary of G? So the boundary of G for us was defined as, I mean, acting on some form, say, uh, uh, for instance, uh, F uh, d pi 2 wedge, wedge d pi n. Right? So the current G act, acting on F d pi 2 wedge, wedge d pi n is nothing but the current G acting on the form d F wedge d pi 2 wedge, wedge d pi n. And now when you go back to definition, this is just going to give you the integral of G times the determinant of the map F pi, pi 2 n, and now you see what happens. So if, for instance, I, I use pi 2 
So pi 2 pi n equal to simply x, x, x2, xn. Then this determinant is very easy to compute. This determinant is just df dx1. And then what you have just discovered is that the boundary of g acting on that particular form is just the integral of g df dx1. OK? On the, other hand, on the other hand, this was an arbitrary choice. I mean, it's just that pi 2 is equal x2. So say, for instance, that you put pi 2 equal x1 and then pi 3 equal x3, then here you would have another partial derivative. OK? So say, if I, for instance, do this, So now the, the current is normal if and only if you have a bound of this in terms of the Lipschitz constants of, the, of, the, of, the, of these things. So dg of finite mass, this is true if and only if you actually have that dg of f d pi 2 wedge wedge d pi n is less or equal than a constant time, times the product of the Lipschitz constant of the pi i's. And this is going from 2 to n uh, times the supremum of modulus of f. And now you apply it to this particular situation. Then the x2, xn, they are all Lipschitz functions with Lipschitz constant equal to 1. So what you actually discover is that your current T or your current G is a normal current if and only if the integral of G dF dxi is less or equal than a constant times the supremum of modulus of f. OK, so but now here you, re you recognize something that you should be familiar with. So what is this, right? So g is actually just an L1 function. So this is just the action of the distributional derivative of g on the function f. And of course, this inequality over here, again, by this representation theorem, is just telling you the distributional derivative of g should actually be a Radon measure. OK? So this means just that g must be a BV function. OK, so this characterizes you normal currents. And actually, if you look at the Federer and Fleming theory, it's exactly the same thing. It's actually easy to see that you can go through the same proof. So this is, for instance, what is, I mean, this is the main idea, which is telling you it's not that difficult to prove that the, in the ambrosio kirchheim theory, the BV functions are actually, I mean, the, the, the normal currents are equal to the BV functions, and therefore, they are equal to the Federer and Fleming normal currents. Okay, so this is the, the, the idea behind the proof of Ambrosio and Kirchheim of the equivalence between the two formulations when you actually have normal currents. Of course, this is just a particular case. You would then have to use push forwards and, and things like that to sort of use this kind of idea, which proves you the uh, identity for n-dimensional currents in Rn to prove the same identity for n-dimensional currents in a Euclidean space with a larger dimension. Okay? So, but this is the, the idea behind it. Um, of course, then somehow the idea is that in some sense when you are normal, you have some kind of a priori estimates on the derivative of this g, right? So it's like, for instance, if it were represented by a measure mu, you would ask, what are actually the measures whose distributional derivatives are also measures? And it's very easy by a, an approximation uh, uh, procedure to see that this is equivalent to be a function, which is bv, right? So that, 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 that shows you uh, why this situation is easier than, than the general one. Okay, so now 
let go also one step further. So usually, right, you would like, I mean, okay, so usually you would like to say, to, to establish a, some kind of identity between certain type of currents and usual submanifolds, okay? So what are submanifolds? So what are n-dimensional submanifolds of Rn? So n-dimensional and dimensional submanifolds of Rn are just open sets of Rn. Right? So if I take an open set omega and I take as G the function the characteristic function of omega, which is equal to 1 if x is in omega and 0 otherwise, right? Then this guy over here gives me, sometimes we will denote it in this way just to be faster, right? Gives me the current which is naturally associated to your to your submanifold. Okay? So now integer, so what, what we said somehow yesterday is that we like to take integral combinations of this, but we don't like to take uh, uh, real combinations of this, right? So it sounds that for natural, just to say that a uh, uh, a current is integer rectifiable of dimension n on Rn if if this current T is representable as some integration with respect to some function G, where G is not only L1, but it also takes only integer values. OK? Now, what is nice about currents is that I can push it forward, right? So I can take an n-dimensional current, and I can take as a map into some larger dimensional space, and I can push it forward. Okay? Now, if you remember the classical, if you remember the classical Stokes theorem, actually this gives you locally any type of integration on a submanifold. Right? So how did you define an integration of a submanifold of Rn? You just take a local chart, right? And then you just pull back the forms from uh, the manifold into the local chart. Okay? So that is exactly equivalent in our language of taking uh, some patch of Rn, which is going to be the integration over some omega, and then look at the map, which is putting this Rn into your Euclidean space in a nice way, and look at the push forward of the corresponding current. Okay? So it doesn't surprise you, therefore, that we actually give a definition of so a general n-dimensional integer rectifiable current in some metric space E is a current of finite mass for which, and now you're going to see the magic three countably many objects which we introduced yesterday so there exists countably many well actually there are going to be only two objects so 
gi in L1 over n, and psi i Lipschitz maps from Rn into E, such that you can formally write, uh, uh, OK, so gi with gi uh, uh, taking values in z. such that t acting on any form omega is given by this formal series acting on omega. Now, of course, you might wonder whether this thing over here converges at all. Well, it turns out that it's no. So it's, 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 it's not, I mean, it's a requirement which makes the series converging, but it's a requirement which essentially uh, uh, is harmless. So maybe this requirement should go before the identity in such a way that you're sure that things converge. So you just require that the sum of the Lipschitz constant of ci to the power n times the L1 norms of the functions gi, they are less than plus infinity. OK? So here, of course, you, you remember yesterday in the Federal and Fleming theory, theory, we had three objects, right? So we had the integration over submanifolds, and then we had integer coefficients. You see, the integer coefficients are just hidden over here, right? So of course, you just could say, I, I can break each gi as a series of integer coefficients functions times the identity uh, times the characteristic functions of some sets omega ij, right? Where omega ij now they are going to be just general Borel sets. Okay, so yesterday we actually introduced to say omega ij have to be uh, uh, closed in set, instead of being just Borel, but it is a simple exercise in measure theory, of course, just to redefining om the omega ij correctly, you actually can actually get omega closed. The only other difference with respect to yesterday is that we insisted that these maps psi i are C1 and not Lipschitz. Actually, it turns out, and it's an effect of, of, of uh, uh, a well-known theorem in, in real analysis, which is called Whitney's extension theorem, that if E is the Euclidean space itself, then you can approximate Lipschitz functions efficiently with C1 functions, and therefore the definition is really equivalent to what I gave you as yesterday. Okay. So, uh, uh, yesterday we had main difference being that the psi i were required to be C1. Okay, but of course then if, if psi i is required to be C1, then, 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 then the metric space has to be Rn. And E equal Rn, the two things are equivalent thanks to Whitney's extension theorem. Very good. So now let us come to the to the important points. So of course now you can introduce a notion of convergence for currents. Right? So and it's a weak notion of convergence. Well, it's what you do usually, right? So you have a certain space of test functions, and your uh, uh, objects are defined by duality. The weak convergence is essentially equal to the pointwise convergence when you fix the test function. Okay? So a sequence 
TK of currents is converging weakly to T if on each test we have TK of omega converges to T of omega. Okay? Now you will notice one thing which is also elementary in usual functional analysis. Since the mass of T is defined by duality, supremizing over a certain set of functions, it's not surprising that the mass is actually a, a lower semi-continuous uh, 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 quantity uh, along weak convergence. Okay? So this is also a very simple exercise. So if TK converges to T weakly, then uh, uh, the mass of TK the limit of the mass of TK is bigger or equal than the mass of T. And the proof is extremely simple. I'll just catch it. So remember, the mass of T is the supremum over Lipschitz constant of pi i's less or equal than 1 and modulus of, of f less or equal than 1 of T evaluated on f d pi 1 wedge wedge d pi n. Right? Now, of course, if, if instead of being a supremum, it would be a maximum, right? If this would be attained, right? If mt is equal to t of some such f d pi 1 wedge wedge d pi n, then, of course, you just would test this t on the sequence. This would be the limit as k goes to infinity of tk tested on the same thing, but then by definition this would be less or equal than the mass of tk. Now of course this is a supremum, so it's not achieved, but for every epsilon you find something such that this one is m of t minus epsilon. And by this of course you have done that the limit is bigger or equal than m of t minus epsilon, and then you let epsilon go to zero. Very easy. Of course, now you are in a very good shape. You just need some compactness to solve your plateau problem, right? So say that you consider a certain S, a certain current S, without boundary. Assume that exists T with finite mass such that the boundary of T is equal to S. Okay, then take a sequence TK such that the mass of TK is converging to the infimum over all possible of R with boundary equal to S of the mass of R. Now what you would like to know is, can I extract a sequence or subsequence, which I still label as TK, which is converging to some T bar? Well, being a boundary is easily seen to be preserved in the limit, just because being a boundary means I have to test on the correct forms. So in the form, you're also a boundary. If I can get the weak limit, then I get the solution of the plateau problem. I just get the minimum by lower semi-continuity. Okay? So the real question is this one. Can I extract the subsequence? So now let us go back to what I told you yesterday. If you're looking for normal currents, so if you allow actually real coefficients instead of integer coefficients, it's a simple functional analysis exercise. Um, well, maybe it's not that simple. but. Somehow, it's, it's really functional analysis and soft arguments, essentially. So the space of normal currents, you could say, it's a Banach space. And this weak convergence, I mean, which is in duality with some other Banach space, 
And this weak convergence is really just the weak topology that you put when you're looking at dual, right? The weak star topology, maybe. I always get confused with this. And then there is a general theorem which tells you that is, you know, the, the, the bounded uh, 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 sets are, are uh, I mean, bounded closed sets are compact, okay? So for normal currents, you have the following theorem. So if TK is a sequence of currents, such that the mass of TK plus the mass of the boundary of TK is uniformly bounded then there exists a subsequence which is converging weakly. So now how would you apply that to that situation? Well, the situation is extremely lucky because the mass of TK is converging to the infimum, so the mass of TK is not exploding. The mass of the boundary is actually just the mass of S, which is fixed, right? So it's a constant. Okay, then you apply the theorem, you get your your, your, your uh, uh, minimizing sequence which is converging and you apply the direct methods of the calculus of variation. Okay, so now what disturbs you of this theorem is that, as I was telling you before, if I take, for instance, a, a, an integral rectifiable current as I've defined, right, but I take half of it, okay, that half of it is admissible, it's, it's in this class, right? So you actually don't like this. So what you would like to do now is to actually take a sequence which is converging to the infimum, but the sequence is required always to be a sequence of integral rectifiable currents. So if I add here integral rectifiable, Of course, if I have integral rectifiable dungeon, then I just have a subclass, right? So I have a subclass to which I can ap apply this theorem. So the TK is converging somewhere. But unfortunately, the somewhere where you are converging might have real coefficients in principle, right? So now the question that you would like to answer is, assume I have a sequence of integral rectifiable currents. And I actually know this thing over here. Is the limit going to be integral rectifiable or not? So question, if the sequence in the theorem is integral rectifiable, is T also? OK, so this is actually what, funnily enough, in the literature is called Federer and Fleming compactness theorem. So the answer is yes. The limit is also integral rectifiable under this assumption. But more than a compactness theorem, it's actually a closure theorem, right? Because the compactness comes out of the, of the, of the functional analysis, right? So this is the question that we want to ask, uh, that we want to answer in the next hour. So let us make a consistency check first. So let us apply it to the easiest situation we know. So let us apply it to n-dimensional currents in Rn, OK? So a sequence of n-dimensional currents in, in Rn is a sequence of BV functions for which I have a uniform bound on the BV norm and which are integer, I mean, which take integer values. So is the limit also going to take inter integer values almost everywhere? Yes, because actually by, by, by Relich, BV embeds compactly locally in L1. So if I look at the functions, the fact that I have a uniform BV bound, it tells me actually the functions are converging L1 to a function in the limit, and then the function in the limit has to take integer values as well, okay? So this gives you another simple exercise. For n-dimensional currents in Rn, the theorem is pretty easy. So for, 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 I mean for, for n-dimensional currents in Rn, the closure theorem, 
is identically equal to the BV compact, I mean compact and bending of BV of functions of bounded variations in L1. So it looks very optimistic. Apart from the fact that if you look at the theorem of the compact and bending of BV in L1, it's way, 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 way much easier <laughs> than the closure theorem for, 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 for integral current, I mean, for integral rectifiable currents. OK, so as I told you, this is one of the cornerstones of the Federer and Fleming theory. OK? But then I told you there are two other very important theorems inside. OK? So they are answering two very interesting questions. So I told you about the boundary integrality theorem or, or rectifiability theorem. So the boundary rectifiability theorem tells you the following fact. If you have an integral, I mean, if you have an integral rectifiable current, which is normal, its boundary is also integral rectifiable. And actually, such nice objects which have boundary, uh, 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 I mean, which has um, rectifiability of both, I mean, integral rectifiability of both the boundary and the current itself are called integral currents. Okay? So such currents are called integral. OK, then, as I told you, the third cornerstone of the theory of Federer and Fleming is the so-called deformation lemma. That is, the possibility of approximating currents with, I mean, under suitable assumptions, with nicer objects. OK? Now, that, of course, for that, of course, I cannot tell you that it's going to hold in any metric space. OK? Because if the metric space is very nasty, actually, the chance that you can approximate any I mean, for instance, say, if, if your metric space allows only essentially Lipschitz maps without any kind of notion of what is C1, then you just see from the start that you don't have a nice way of approximating Lipschitz functions. So you cannot expect to have a nice way of approximating currents in general. Okay. Although, of course, what you can imagine is that maybe the, the situation is slightly like here, uh, like here when you have a metric space which does not allow too much nice things, maybe the the, the rectifiable currents are simply not there. Maybe it's just void, right? I mean, maybe they're just trivial. Anyway, the deformation lemma gives you possibility of approximating currents in the Euclidean space. So approximating integral rectifiable and more general integral currents nicely with smoother objects. Let me just tell one effect, which will be very important later on, next week. So a corollary of the deformation lemma is the following isoperimetric inequality. So there is a constant C, which depends only on M and N, such that for any closed, so for any current T with the boundary of T equal to 0, there exists a current S. Of course, this is a current of dimension M. With the boundary equal to 0, there exists a current S of dimension m plus 1, such that 
the boundary of S is equal to T, uh, sorry, the boundary of T is equal to S, and the mass of T is less or equal than a constant times the mass of S to the power m plus 1 divided by m. And in addition, if the current S is integer rectifiable, actually you can choose the current T to be integer rectifiable as well. Right, right. Um, yes, yes, sorry. Yes. I am getting confused on the notation, on my own notation. Yes. Okay, so let's draw a picture and then say T here, S here. Yeah, I think now it's correct. Right. Exist. Okay, so if T is integer rectifiable, then there exists S as above, which is also integer rectifiable. Right? And this kind of closed the discussion on the plateau problem. Now, say, you give me a smooth manifold, which is closed in Rn. I apply the deformation theorem, and I find a first integer rectifiable current, which bounds it, and which has a bound on the mass. So I know that... Uh, the set on which I want to actually apply the direct methods of the calculus of radiation is non-empty. And then I apply all this machinery and I get a minimizer, which is an area minimizing current with that given boundary. Okay? So now uh, let's make a 10 minutes break. And then, of course, I'm not going to give you a proof of the, of the um, uh, closure theorem, but I'm going to give you uh, some ideas on how it can be proved in an efficient way uh, uh, using modern techniques which have been introduced in the last 10 years. Um, so let me just say, the, I mean, the first proof by Federer and Fleming of this theorem actually relied on a very hard study of rectifiable sets. In particular, it relied on what was called, on what is called the, the Bezikovic federer uh, uh, rectifiability criterion, huh? which is a pretty um, hard theorem in functional analysis, in, 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 in real analysis. Okay. So, um, okay, so there's one thing which I am forgetting here, maybe in the, isometric, in the isoperimetric inequality, I didn't tell you what is this n of dimension less than n in Rn. Okay, so we're talking about Euclidean currents. And actually, if you want, I mean, the best the best proof up to now of this isoperimetric inequality gives you that the constant does not depend on n. In fact, it depends only on m. And the worst possible thing for this constant is the boundary of an m plus 1 dimensional disk. Okay? So it's also a computable constant. And it's a, it's a word by Angren. Okay? But the original proof of Federer and Fleming just gives you a constant which depends also on the dimension of the Ampian space. Sorry? The current T has to be integer. The current T has? To be an integer current. No, no, no. No. If it is integer rectifiable, you get an integer rectifiable current. If you multiply by lambda, right? No, okay, sure, you're right. Uh, you have to get rid of the you have you have to get rid of the homogeneity. Uh, yes, okay. I, I think you need then a boundary a bound from below. Or you put the sides. Or you put the sides. Yeah, if you have real coefficients, the minimizer is exactly lambda times. Yes, you are correct. No, you have to put integer rectifiable. I mean, even on BV is, is, is false in this way. Yes, okay. 
So you have to put integrity firewall, you are correct. Yes. Okay, there's something that you can do for, for, for there is something that you can do for normal currents as well. Uh, but now I don't remember exactly how you formulate it. But he's correct that you need integrectifiable. So um, in, 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 the, in the top dimensional case, when you have a BV function, you can, of course, write down what is the Poincaré inequality, but the Poincaré inequality wouldn't have the, the gain in the exponent. OK, yeah, thanks. Good, so let us now go to the compactness, well, to the compactness theorem. Okay, so our first case, which is going to be extremely easy, is prove it for zero dimensional currents. Okay, and it's of course very easy because you can just, well, of course, for zero dimensional currents, in principle, I've not defined to you what is an integral rectifiable current. Well, the definition of zero dimensional integral rectifiable currents. So these are simply linear combination of Dirac deltas with the integral coefficients. Now, the boundary of a zero dimensional current is zero by definition. So, in this case, you just have the following property. So, say, if the metric space E is locally compact, then what you reduce to prove is simply that you have a sequence TK, which is the sum of some Dirac mass. You don't know how many. And of course, if you have integral coefficients, you can just decide You can, just you, you can just decide that um, okay, so you can just decide that the um, sign over here is either plus or minus. So maybe let us write it in the following way. And then, of course, without loss of generality, you can assume extracted subsequences 
the QK is equal to a certain constant Q, that uh, uh, the X I K are converging for K to infinity to some X I, and that the Y I K are converging to some Y I. Okay, and this would actually give you that the TK is converging weakly to the sum of the DXI minus the sum of the DYI. Of course, in general, if you're not compact, but just locally compact, or if you're a general metric space, if you have a sequence TK with the mass of TK, which is uniformly bounded, which consists of zero dimensional currents, and moreover, the support of TK is contained in a compact subset of E, then there exists a subsequence such that the TK is converging weakly to T. And T is as well integer rectifiable. So z zero dimensional integer rectifiable coverage is integer rectifiable as well. Of course, without this assumption, you see immediately that there's a problem. The TK, I mean, some Dirac delta, for instance, in Rn might escape to plus infinity. And since you're not, OK, so at this point, you have a choice. Either you start testing with compactly supported functions if you want, and then you can still talk about some weak notion of convergence. But in general, in a metric space E, in which we are not uh, 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 making uh, uh, assumptions like being compactly supported. If something is escaping at plus infinity, then you don't have a chance to capture it. Okay? So, in fact, uh, in the theorem about the compactness of normal currents, which I told you, there is one assumption missing, and the assumption missing is that the supports are not escaping to plus infinity. So, maybe I should, should better say something like that. So, let me actually get the correct assumption which I forgot. So in addition to the hypothesis that you have a uniform control on the mass of the current and of the boundary, you actually have to put also the following hypothesis. So for every, say, epsilon bigger than 0, there exists a compact set K. Such that the mass of what is outside is fairly small. Okay, so for instance, on the Euclidean space, this would tell you the amount of mass which is escaping to infinity is essentially zero. 
Um, anyway, for the problem that we are looking at, for instance, for the plateau problem in Aren, one thing, one first thing that you could remark is that if I give you a nice boundary, right, you can actually take the convex hull of this boundary, and without loss of generality, you can assume that your minimizing sequence belongs to this convex hull. Okay? So if it's not in the convex hull, of course, you can just reproject the entire Rn with the Lipschitz map on the convex hull, and this projection is actually decreasing the mass. Okay? So in all the cases of interest, you just get this, this, this extra hypothesis by, by some additional remark. Yeah? Very good. So um, let us therefore simply from now on assume that this is not an issue. So let us assume that E is compact. And see, one thing that we would like to understand is how to use this simple observation that zero dimensional currents are compact eh, to, I mean, to, 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 to uh, conclude the same thing in higher dimension. Okay? So for instance, how, would, uh, how am I going to conclude this for uh, uh, curves, which would be one dimensional objects? Okay? So from now on, say E is compact. And one thing that I would like to understand is how to use zero dimensional, uh, the zero dimensional statement uh, 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 to infer the same compactness argument in higher dimension. OK, so this is answered by the so-called slicing technique, which was introduced already by Federer and Fleming, and uh, which has been recast in the metric space setting by uh, Ambrosio and Kirchheim. So of course, the idea is, is kind of uh, uh, simple. The idea would be that if you have a curve, for instance, right? And if I take a curve and I intersect it with a um, number of parallel lines, right? The intersection between these lines and the curve is typically a zero dimensional set, right? And if the curve is actually smooth, the Sartre's theorem is telling you the points where you don't intersect, I mean, the, 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 the points down in which the intersection is actually not uh, a finite number of points, so something where uh, you would have, for instance, uh, a touching over here, or where you would have uh, infinitely many crossings. This is actually a zero-dimensional set down there. Okay? So the basic idea of the slicing theory is how to embed the um, so how to, how to make rigorous this idea of chopping a, a, a current into smaller dimensional section. So one, one first observation that I want to give you is the following. So if I have a submanifold without boundary, right? And I chop it, say, with a um, hyperplane, OK? The section of this is nothing but the boundary of the restriction of your submanifold to the half space. Okay. So observe if, say, sigma is a submanifold without boundary. And more in general, you don't need actually to take a hyperplane. Pi from Rn to R, the C1 function, smooth function, and T, a regular value for pi. Formally, you have this identity, the intersection of pi to the minus 1 of t with your surface sigma. Huh? It's nothing but the boundary of sigma intersected to the open set pi less than t. OK? So let me draw a picture over here. So say this is the set by equal t, 
on this side you have pi less than t. And then here, for instance, you have a curve. Right? And the intersection of this boundary with the curve is just going to be this point. And you recognize that this point is the boundary of this manifold over here. OK, of course, this is not true for every t. This is true for almost every t, right? And that is actually an application of Sartre's theorem. So it looks very tempting to just say that the slicing of your, of your, of your current eh, by, for instance, parallel planes simply is equivalent to take the boundary of the current restrict it to the upper half, I mean, to the lower half space, for instance. Of course, this has to be corrected. So assume that your current t, assume that your current t instead had a boundary. So assume that your current t had also a boundary over here, some boundary point. Of course, then if I take the boundary of the intersection of your submanifold with the lower, uh, uh, I mean, with this, with this portion of the blackboard, I actually get two points in the boundary. One point is the, the, the boundary I like, and the other point is the boundary I don't like. Okay? So, but what is this? This is just the boundary of the manifold restricted to this set, right? Of course, if there is a boundary over here, then I'm not counting it by that operation. Okay? Okay, so this suggests the following slicing procedure. So this is a tentative definition of what the slice should be. So if, say, pi is a map from E into R, and T is an m-dimensional normal current, then the slice of t through pi at t is the current defined by the following formula. So it's the boundary of the current t restricted to um, pi. I think it's less than t. plus the boundary of t restricted to the set pi bigger than t. OK, so remember we had the restriction operator defined for forms or functions. So what I'm implying over here is that I'm restricting on the indicator function of this. Right? So when I actually write this, t restricted to some set omega, what I mean is what we actually defined with the following notation t restricted to the zero-dimensional form, which is the uh, 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 indicator function of the open set omega. So this would simply mean if I want to evaluate t uh, uh, restricted to omega on little omega, I'm actually going to do this. 
So now, one of the things that you would like to imagine is that although I have my slicing function defined in the following way, so there is a Fubini type argument that I can use to define my uh, 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 slicing function. So look, for instance, at the following situation. So assume your curve is given by the graph of something. OK, so if the curve is defined by the graph of that, of course, it's pretty easy. OK, so now consider pi to be the projection on the first variable. Which is x1. And the map t pi x1 is nothing but the Dirac mass which is sitting at the point x1, f of x1. OK? So now the question that you would like to ask is maybe the following. I, I, I would like to reconstruct somehow what is my current uh, over here, this line, by possibly integrating over the sections, right? The intersections. And of course, one thing that I could, for instance, do is, well, I can test the deltas against the test function phi, right? And then for every x1, I get a number. So for instance, assume that I'm integrating this over what actually happens. And this is a simple remark in this case. So assume you're actually making the following thing. So assume you integrate over t pi x1. So this you can actually test on a function g uh, 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 and then multiply by a test function psi x1 and then integrate by dx1. So test in this situation what you get. OK, so in this situation you just get the integral, right, of um, psi of x1, and then you have uh, g of x1, f of x1, right, dx1. And you actually check right away this is nothing but the current, I mean, the integral over gamma of the form psi of x1, g of x1, uh, uh, sorry, g of x1, x2, dx1. OK? So, and this is nothing but the action of the current gamma on the form psi of x1, dx1, g, which actually is nothing but the restriction of gamma on psi composed pi, d pi. OK? So and this actually, uh, we have done it in, 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 I mean, for one dimensional curve, but it's not difficult to see that you can actually generalize it to uh, uh, n-dimensional graphs. OK? So one very nice formula that, therefore, you can imagine is what you get when you're slicing the current with your function pi is the following. So if you want, this is a proposition. Given the way I have defined you the current, uh, the slice of the current, if t is a normal current, then you actually have the following identity that, in some sense, the integral of t pi x acting on some form omega and multiplied by some function psi of x 
x, this is equal of, I mean, to t restricted to psi composed pi d pi computed on omega. Okay? Very good. Now you can take, of course, recursively slicing. So say if I give you a two-dimensional surface, right, you can first slice in one coordinate to get one-dimensional curves, and then you can slice it in the second coordinate to get actually Dirac mass. So you can either take this definition which I gave you, which is operative and sort of imply inductively over more and more uh, 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 projections. So which would give you the slice with respect to a map pi, which instead of being r-valued is going to be rk-valued. Or of course the other thing that you could try to prove is the existence of a map which simply makes this identity true, but this times for a pi which is a, a, an rk-valued map. Okay? And remember that when I write here d pi, of course I'm meaning d pi 1 wedge, wedge d pi k. Okay? So both things are possible. So let me summarize that, then here what is the main slicing theorem that you can prove in the theory. Um, Where is it? Lost it now. That's not the compactness. I guess I must have messed up when I was preparing the lectures. Yes. Uh, yes. Here it is. Okay. So, theorem. Okay, so let T be a normal k-dimensional current. And pi from E into Rm a Lipschitz map with m less or equal than k. Okay. Then there exists a map x from rk into t pi x normal m minus k dimensional curve, k minus m dimensional current. Weakly measurable. So weakly measurable would simply mean that when I take this t pi x, I test it against the form omega, then I get a function which is Lebesgue measurable as a function of x. with the following properties. So first of all, so t pi x 
boundary and its boundary are supported in the counter image of the point X, then the identity one holds then second the integral over rm of the mass of t phi x dx is equal. And so this is an integration of measures. So what I mean is that this is going to give you a measure. If you want to understand how this measure x on a function of f, you integrate with respect to this measure the function f. And then you integrate with respect to dx. And this is equal to the mass of the restriction of t on d pi. If pi is a one dimensional then t pi x is given by the boundary of t restricted on <coughs> pi bigger than x minus t restricted, I mean, minus the boundary of t restricted on pi bigger than x. And then finally, Fourth, uh, the integral of the mass of the boundary of t pi x is less or equal than the Lipschitz constant of pi times the mass of t plus the mass of the boundary. Okay. So this is the slicing you have. And somehow, you can now make the following type of, 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 um, of um, I mean, you, you can think about currents also in the following way. You see, one thing that I can do is the following. I can take. Uh, uh, oh, maybe I should actually point out something more over here. There is the, fa the fifth important point. If your current T is integer rectifiable, then also the slice is. for almost every x. OK? And maybe a little comment about this fifth property. Uh, as you see, integer rectifiable currents have been defined in such a way that you're just pushing forward via Lipschitz maps. OK? So in a sense, you, you, you can imagine that the only thing you have to care about is trying to prove this statement over here, right? Uh, uh, the fact that your slice is integer rectifiable in the Euclidean setting and for top dimensional currents. And then you will simply see that essentially what you have stated over here is just the coaria formula. Okay, so that's another way of actually slicing uh, uh, um, uh, sub manifolds or rectifiable objects in Rn in general. Okay? But more than spending time on this, I want to actually uh, spend some time on the effect. So now, this point number five is simply telling you if you actually choose m equal to k 
then your slice is going to be exactly a family of Dirac masses, which is varying with x. Okay? Of course, one thing that you can ask yourself is, uh, what happens if instead of giving you the current, I just give you the slices with respect to some particular direction? Okay? In general, of course, you're, you don't expect to reconstruct the current by this information. Right? For instance, if I have a vertical line and I'm slicing with vertical directions, right? so I will not see this line. And there's no wonder that I will not see this line because the identity is just telling you, the identity which I canceled is telling you that what you're looking by slicing is just the restriction of t to d pi. Okay? On the other hand, say that, for instance, you are on Rn. Right? So if you are on Rn, you can take any form and write it as a linear combination of the forms which are of the type dxi. Right? And these are finitely many. Okay? And now you know that when you're actually evaluating t on any of these dxi, right, you can reconstruct what this is uh, by integrating the slices. Okay? So if I say, if I give you a curve, essentially this is kind of telling you that if I give you the slice in the horizontal and in the vertical direction, you should be completely able to reconstruct what the current is initially. Okay? So that introduces a point of view which is very powerful. You can actually think about currents as a bunch of Dirac masses which are varying with your parameter x. Okay? On the other hand, there is something more to that. Uh, if I give you a generic map which to every point x is assigning Dirac masses, it's not clear at all that this gives you a current which is nice. Okay? So for instance, think about having these Dirac masses, I mean, think about having a, a Dirac mass which is depending on x1, and it's going to be a Dirac, a Dirac mass on the point x1, f of x1. But the function f is a completely crazy function, which is varying a lot. Okay? Of course, you will have something which uh, uh, is a current, but you will, not, you will not have something which looks like a nice current. Okay? So what is decisive here is the following fact. Normal currents have slices such that this map has some regularity in x. Okay? Actually, some f hopefully some form of derivative in x which might be taken. Okay? So in particular, make the following observation. If I know that the current, I mean, if I know that the curve has finite length, Right? And I'm slicing over here and over there. And I know that the curve has finite length and no boundary. What is the distance between these two Dirac mass? It's at most the length of the curve which is sitting on this slice. Okay? Of course, the length of the curve maybe in there might be very large, but it cannot be everywhere large. If the length of, on a slab is very large everywhere, then you have a huge length. So this is, for instance, kind of telling you that maybe if I control the length of the curve, I'm able, for instance, to control the W1 norm of uh, uh, the function f on which my Dirac mass is sitting. Okay? This is true if it were always being just one slice. This would literally be true. You could really prove it, right? Because you could actually just say, okay, so if this is x f of x, right, and this is x g of x, right, then modulus, uh, sorry, uh, uh, x2, uh, well, okay, so now y, f of y, right? You could actually say f of y minus f of x is obviously less or equal than the length of the curve intersecting uh, uh, this, this slab. So, uh, uh, x less than x1 less than y, right? And now you notice immediately this thing over here gives you a measure. So this you could define as the measure of the internal of, of the interval x y, where the measure mu is simply defined. So this is simply defined the length of gamma intersected with the set uh, 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 x1, x2, 
such that x1 belongs to um, e, to i. Okay? So you realize immediately that this is just a Radon measure. So what you have discovered is that actually f of y minus f of x is less or equal than the Radon measure evaluated on the interval. And that tells you that the function is a function of bounded variation. Okay? So this suggests you that maybe being this slice, if I interpret it in the correct way, I actually get that this mapping is a mapping of bounded variation. Okay? But of course, you have to interpret it in, in the correct way because you don't have a graph of a function. One possibility right, is that, for instance, my map does something like this. I don't know. So here it could be, for instance, valued two valued curve. And here one valued curve. And here another one valued curve. Right? So now all of a sudden the slice is made of two points. Well, as long as I'm following one of the branches, actually I do discover that I, I have a BV function, right? But I mean over here I have two BV functions, but then when I join them all together, here I have one single BV, BV function with two values. Okay, so it does not uh, restrict to, to, to functions. On the other hand, what we are going to see actually is that there is a way of encoding this idea that since you're actually slicing, slicing a normal current, okay, you actually have a nice dependence on x. So this we will see at the beginning of the next lecture, which is on Thursday. So in which sense I can actually say that this is a BV map. Now, what the only thing I want to say is that once you get this information, you can imagine that then you can complete the proof of the compactness theorem or of the closure theorem. Okay? Because it would look a lot like when you're proving Ascoli Arzela, for instance. So, when you're proving Ascoli Arzela theorem, you have the equicontinuity, and then you know that you're taking values on a compact set. Okay? When you're taking values on the compact set, this is telling you if I look at the values of the functions at the given point, I get a sequence of points in the compact set. I can extract a subsequence, and I can pass into the limit, right? And for instance, I can do this on a dense set. But then that's all I can do, right? I can do it on a, on a dense set, and then I would have somehow pointwise convergence on the dense set. But then how do I actually get convergence of the whole sequence of functions? Well, the equicontinuity is helping you on, on, on the nearby points, right? So once you have actually extracted a sequence which is converging somewhere, in, in, at a given point, the equicontinuity tells you, hey, in the points nearby, you cannot actually go too far off. Okay? So this is, in, an, is, this is in, an, in a nutshell the uh, idea which is behind the modern proof. Once you, actually, you have actually proved that this is a BV map, you have enough equicontinuity in the x variable. Of course, you will not really have equicontinuity because you know a BV map is not a continuous map, but still you have some regularity in the x variable to be able to use the zero-dimensional compactness case to actually conclude that you're compact, OK? So we are not going to see this part, but what you're going to see next time is how you encode or how you can define uh, 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 BV maps taking values in this space, which is, of course, an infinite dimensional space, and how you can use the structure of a current to prove a nice, simple estimate for, for, for the BV norm of this map, OK? And so that's going to take 10 minutes, and then we move on really to the regularity theory. So the first thing that we will see is uh, how you can try to get hold of regularity by uh, uh, approximating with harmonic functions in some points. Okay.